Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Professor Sujata Sharma. As the president of Biofootprints, uh, I welcome you all to the first Marie Curie Excellence Award Lecture. And uh, our speaker is Dr. Yasmin Ahmed, who is currently working as Scientist E in Peptide and Proteomics Division, DPAS. I also, before I introduce her, I want to um, congratulate her for uh, this uh, wonderful uh, award, Mary Curie Excellence Award. This We got a lot of entries and um, a very esteemed selection committee went through all the entries and uh, we were so proud to see that uh, such a renowned person has uh, actually applied for this award and we are really happy. So we are uh, going to have the event later on, but we thought we should first have the online lectures. So this is uh, Dr. Yasmin Ahmed. She earned her PhD degree from Aligarh Muslim University in analytical chemistry. Since 2006, she has been working on the human physiological alterations and their molecular signatures. She has achieved notable success in answering some critical questions of high altitude phys physiology. Some of her significant contributions are first ever development of non-pharmacological, radiological verified rodent high altitude pulmonary edema model, that is HAPE. She's provided a proof of concept for a shorter acclimatization protocol during high altitude exposure. And then she has done brilliant proteomic studies of um, blood platelets where the clinical relationship of calpane protein was established with hypobaric hypoxia induced thrombosis. Her scientific achievements for this tenure include 37 original research articles in peer reviewed international journals like Blood, PLOS One, Scientific Reports, FRBM, Life Sciences, Redox Biology, Biomedicine, and very recently in Epitosis. She has been the recipient of many prestigious awards and today we are very proud to welcome her on Biofootprints, which is basically a platform for science promotion and popularization. Now over to you, Dr. Yasmin Ahmed. Thank you, ma'am. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the bio footprint teams, especially Dr. Professor Sujata Sharma for giving me this uh, you know, opportunity to talk about my work today and for considering my credentials for this uh, Marie Curie Excellence Award. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, without, uh, I think, uh, wasting time, I should uh, start with my presentation. Uh, and uh, if you allow me, so uh, should I start, ma'am? Yes, please start. Okay. Uh, so in the next uh, 30 minutes, I will be talking on the topic entitled Deciphering the Puzzle of Hyperbaric Hypoxia in terms of proteomics, prophylaxic, and modeling approach. So starting with my first slide, uh, for the last uh, 10 years, for the last 15 years, I have been working in this field of high altitude stress. So as we know that exposure, exposure to high altitude causes the generation. Ma'am, am, am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes, mean you're audible. Please carry on. Okay, okay, ma'am. Uh, exposure to high altitude results in the generation of free heretical species. And if this generation is less, it provides protection and adaptation at high altitude. As vessel level of uh, ROS is required to maintain the cellular hemostasis at high altitude. But if it is in excess, it causes the oxidative stress. And oxidative damage of the biomolecules like lipid, DNA, protein. And these less to the high altitude related illness, that is uh, high altitude pulmonary edema, uh, high altitude uh, cerebral uh, edema, acute mountain sickness. So now the question arises, why we are interested in something that happens in the remote far flung area? If we look at the geographical statistics, 
you know, uh, we have found that 25% of the world uh, geographical area is high altitude. Nearly one forty people live at high, high altitude, and more than a million of people visit high altitude every year. The most important and the critical issue is our strategic deployment of armed forces, where high altitude uh, illness is more serious issue and concern. If we see the figure, this is published by Hickert, uh, Hickert, uh, Hickert et al. in 2004, we can see that in India, in India 49 soldiers had acute mountain sickness. And this is a very, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, this is a serious concern. So it is very important to define the scientific questions more precisely, um, the, uh, more precisely, uh, you know, the rationale of my work. So um, uh, the key questions are, can we develop some proteomic signatures that help in the diagnosis for the high altitude illness? And uh, can we, uh, you know, develop some uh, uh, markers to assess the acclimatization? And can we recommend it, uh, shortly acclimatization protocols uh, uh, for the army? And what are the molecular cascades that are triggered by hyperbaric hypoxia related to acute mountain sickness or acclimatization? Can we deliver site effect free prophylactic interventions um, uh, with proven efficacy and safety? And can we create animal models for high altitude illness uh, without any genetic and pharmacological manip manipulation? If we go through the literature, we have found that uh, there are some, uh, you know, some lacuna and there's some, you know, uh, missing links. Like we don't know the early diagnostic marker for HAIP. We don't know the signaling networks that help in acclimatization. And what are the acclimatization marker? No post translation modifications in terms of high altitude illness or acclimatization have been done till far. No objective methods to assess acclimatization and no proof of concept for rapid acclimatization. So uh, it is very important. So it is very important to study uh, how the proteome affects at high altitude. The last project, uh, we uh, in our last uh, last sub project, uh, we were uh, any uh, we have uh, developed some methods that how to improve the combat e efficiency at high altitude. Well, the combat efficiency means being prepared for combat within the shortest possible time and within the minimal logistical effect. And if you see the current acclimatization protocol, it is neither saving time nor efforts, and there is a need to review and upgrade the acclimatization protocol. So in this, uh, uh, so in this regard, we were able to provide a proof of concept for the shorter acclimatization when the rate of ascent is very high. Well, high altitude exp exposure is dependent on two factors. One is time of exposure, and second is the intensity of exposure. In our in our previous in uh, previous studies related to temporal uh, uh, study of the proteome at high altitude. We have found that at 24 hours, there is a maximum perturbation of proteome. And this is uh, confirmed by the confirmed by the medical literature, which suggests that most of the high altitude illness occurs first 24 hour of hyperbaric hypoxia exposure. In this study, uh, we, so we uh, studied the effects of altitude variation on rats to propose a model for rapid acclimatization at extreme altitude as rapid acclimatization has been stated by army commanders as the golden objective for high altitude deployment. So high altitude is divided into three zones. One is high altitude, very high altitude, and extreme altitude. Where the uh, altitude here, the, uh, take, uh, where the chosen altitudes here are corresponded, are corresponded to these zones. We, uh, what we did, we exposed the rat at the at a, at a fixed exposure of 24 hours at different altitudes, 10,000 feet, 15,000 feet, and 25,000 feet. And we have found that, that when there is a direct exposure at 25,000 feet, we have found that there was 100% mortality. In order, and when we have seen that uh, while in the case of 15,000 uh, 15, feet, there was no mortality. In, in order to help the animals to survive at extreme uh, altitude, that is at 25,000 feet, we have given a free exposure for 10 hours at 15,000 feet, followed by one hour normoveric norm normoxia exposure, and immediately elevated, uh, elevated the rats at 25,000 feet, 
we have found that there was a complete reversal of mortality to survivability upon rapid induction. And this prompted us to look into the molecular effects causing reversal of mortality to survivability. We performed the quantitative protomac, protomics to understand how the exposure at 15,000 feet helped the animals to survive at 20,000 feet. And uh, we absorbed that at very high altitude, that at 3,000 feet, the lungs suffered from redox stress, and we have uh, validated the proteins related to it, NRP, PRDX, GTX, and thioredoxin. And we have found that there, uh, uh, you know, there is a decline of these at 50,000 uh, feet. We have also checked the levels of cytoskeleton proteins like um, uh, women entin, actin, cubulin, and the same decline at 15,000 feet. And we have also checked the protein, uh, proteins related to energy metabolism, right? Uh, RxR, MDH, GATDH, and uh, also uh, uh, also this upstream uh, uh, molecule like STAT3 and CALPIN2, this is the downstream molecules. We again decline at 50,000 feet. But after, after our pre exposure regimen, we have found that the recovery of these proteins closely to the baseline levels. So this is confirming our pre-exposure regimen and uh, causes the survivability at high altitude. And this, Michael, this uh, recovery of all the biological process led to the activation of the systemic rescue mechanism, which were, which were activated just before the 25,000 feet and causes the survivability. Hello. Hello. Excuse me, ma'am. Your voice is going down and down. Uh, now it's fine. Yeah, a little better. Okay. Uh, let me switch. Yeah, it's fine now. It's fine. Okay, ma'am. Now it's fine. Hello, yes. Am I yeah. Possible? Yeah. Now you're. Now it's fine. Perfect. Okay. So uh, in this study, we have find uh, we did the network analysis and we have identified some of the pathways which are responsible for survivability. And we have also identified the zone that is the 15,000 feet at where there is a direct uh, rapid induction can be possible. We find and we have found this uh, 15,000 feet that is a very high altitude zone is found to be very beneficial for further exposure, even to the higher intensity that is at 25,000 feet. So we have given in this study the proof of concept for rapid acclimatization. Now, one of the important thing here, I want to mention that uh, uh, we have checked the level of this cytoskeletal uh, proteins. And this is the, you know, uh, the, the level declines at 15,000 feet. And this is the reason why the lung to fail at extreme altitude because cytoskeletal rearrangements will affect every single aspect of lung cell, but from metabolism to signaling. And this particular event has been prominent in HAPE cases. HAPE patients also suffer from the major reshuffling and disruption of the cytoskeletal elements. And the restoring recovery of these elements closer to the normoxic level is again assurance of the re robustness of our pre-exposure regimen and hence, we can say that the recovery of all these cytoskeletal elements absorbed at 25,000 acclimatized group, this one, and, uh, you know, elements at ITNA indicates a termination of the events that may lead to the at uh, cellular level. After our study on rats, we wanted to trans translate our uh, this markers in human. So uh, in this study, uh, 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 till date we don't have any objective based methods to assess acclimatization. An absence of uh, uh, and absence of illness is considered as acclimatization. Only the subjective physical symptoms or the late Lewis score is used for determining the absence and the presence of acute mountain sickness. Absence of acute mountain sickness is the indirect confirmation of acclimatization. Indian Army <coughs> follows a standard prot protocol for acclimatization based on slow graded acid. That is the gradual acclimatization of varying days at different altitudes. And it is based on finishing a physical task 
running and climbing at the end of the fixed exposure before ascending further. Well, this is a good factor that can be improved and further strengthened by adding the protein panel to it with the already established subjective and qualitative test. So in this, uh, uh, so in this study, what we have done, we have taken the two uh, separate groups of uh, male Indian army based on the stages of acclimatization that uh, this at 30, uh, at this uh, first stage uh, happened, uh, occurred at uh, 3500 meter and the second occurred at 4420 meter. After this, we, uh, we uh, you know, we did the plasma, uh, uh, plasma to uh, proteome analysis of some pre-selected proteins and based on their validated presence in the plasma recurrence in multiple proteomic studies related to the hypoxia, high altitude, novelty, statistical visibility, and ELISA suitability. After we performed this uh, ELISA uh, in both the groups and pro plotted their trend lines. And following, we have found that these proteins, thyroidoxin, uh, thyroidoxase, GPX, ApoA1, apolipoprotein, and along with the one of our HAP. Uh, this uh, indicator that is sulfur transferase as a negative control, this particular protein uh, increased only in case of HAPE patients, and it is the biomarker of uh, HAPE and uh, uh, could be used to assess the acclimatization at a uh, high altitude. As we can see that here, the TRS level is, you know, uh, as the exposure increases, it declines, especially in the second stage of. Uh, uh, acclimatization. So it could be a defining feature to assess acclimatization. As in case of, uh, you know, GPX, we, it is holding well because uh, it, it, it is holding well. It's becomes, uh, you know, it's not declining at all. This is very important uh, uh, feature when the GPX is not uh, changing at all and the TRX is, uh, you know, keep declining. This is very important to maintain the redox homeostasis at high altitude. Again, we have che checked this uh, sulfur transferase. This is the HAPE biomarker, and we have found do not show any change, uh, you know, uh, uh, during the high altitude exposure. And this is the cat uh, colmeduline molecule. This is not, uh, you know, this is the only decline at the longer, uh, at the uh, second stage of acclimatization. FOA1, this is the lipid metabolism, one of the uh, important, play, important role in lipid metabolism. And again, it's uh, showing some, but uh, it's not showing any changes in the first stage of diplomatization much, but uh, there is some increased in this uh, as compared to the baseline uh, in the second stage of acclimatization. So following these, uh, you know, these could be used as the diagnostic panel uh, to assess the acclimatization at high altitude. <laughs> Am I audible? Uh, your voice had gone just now, but now it's come back. Have just a moment. I'm uh, I'm having some water actually. So no problem. Thank you, ma'am. Now coming to the next. So after gaining an understanding of the. Am, am I audible? Yes, yes, mainly you are audible. Yeah, so after gaining, gaining an understanding of the plasma proteomic response to hypoxia, we wanted to explore the library proteome. The reason for investigating this is uh, this just to simplify the process of sample collection. And uh, based on the other advantages of saliva, like uh, uh, you know, minimum risk of infection, well tolerated by the patient, sample processing, non-invasive, safer to collect. Based on these advantages, we replicated our previous strategy for finding altitude acclimatization uh, markers in saliva. So the study sample collector samples were collected from the Indian Army volunteers at uh, you know, different uh, exposure points, seven days, 30 days, 120. After this, we did the quantitative proteomics followed by the uh, uh, pathway analysis that we validated after our proteins by using the immunoblotting techniques and immunoassays. And uh, we have identified, uh, you know, the uh, number of proteins like uh, 50, uh, in this case at high altitude, seven, we have identified 56 proteins. 
in case of high altitude 30, we have identified uh, at, uh, 36 and then 41. And uh, uh, in this, we have identified in uh, day seven, we have identified that uh, in, uh, that, uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, four proteins, uh, we have identified how to be upregulated. While, uh, while the remaining 52 downregulated again spawn this in case of uh, 30 days, 10 were upregulated, 36 downregulated, uh, in uh, 127 were upregulated and 41 downregulated. And after doing this pathway, uh, uh, pathway analysis, we have found that the following pathways, where we can see the trends of their up and down regulation are summarized in this table, like LXR, RXR activation, down regulated in the, the day seven, activated in uh, 30 and further normalized in 120 days. Acute phase signaling and this production of nitric oxide again down regulated, further down regulated, and down regulated in the last uh, exposure. And uh, we have observed that there was a specific trend of down regulation of specific proteins like alpha enolase, like human albumin alpha enolase. And uh, this could be used as, uh, you know, one of the uh, defining feature for exploitation. Well, this, uh, uh, we have also validated one of the proteins that plays very important role in lipid metabolism, that is the phospholipid protein transfer peak. And it is found to be increased in high altitude days, uh, day 30 and 120, 120 groups. Here we can see. Now, after this, uh, we have also fire, uh, I, uh, we have also validated one of the important proteins that is the carbonic anhydride stick. It is very important to maintain, very important uh, for uh, to maintain important to maintain the pH synthesis in various species and biological fluids of uh, human body, and also plays very important role in uh, res uh, respiration. So this is uh, this we have found to be upregulated in the case of high altitude day thirty exposure. And after that, uh, in all the uh, uh, in all the other groups, uh, we can see that this uh, nearly this level is nearly to the normoxy groups. And further, uh, uh, further, we can conclude that this following proteins could be translated into a putative non-invasive panel for assessing high altitude acclimatization. Now, coming to how to improve acclimatization by using the profile exit. So here we use silymarine, and uh, we uh, here in this study we explore the potential application of silymarine, that is a polyphenol flavonoid compound that is not toxic in nature, and by improving its bioavailability and solubility for oral suspension. So again we have uh, uh, we have uh, taken male SD rats and divided into four groups: normoxia, hypoxia, normoxia with the drug, and hypoxia with drug. So uh, now uh, we expose the rat for at uh, 25,000 feet uh, for five days. And uh, here we have mentioned at 25,000 feet. And after that, we collected the lung and the plasma, uh, uh, lung and the plasma for further analysis. Now, uh, what we did, we formulated a homogeneous and uh, stable aqueous suspension of silymarine by sonicating in water baths for 15 minutes. After this, we measure the particle size and the zeta potential by using the dynamic light scattering system, that is the nano track. We found that there was a reduction in size from 23 micron to 5 micron in sonicated one. The reduction in size also promoted the particle stability. So we measured the zeta potential here in this. And we have found that the large, larger zeta potential um, we have found that the larger zeta potential for the sonicated one, that is above uh, above this 30 electron volt. And we have, uh, and uh, above the, uh, till 45 minutes. And when we compare to the crude silymarine, crude silymarine solution showing lower zeta potential, that indicates the lower stability. This is also confirmed by the visual examination of particle stability for 45 minutes. And we absorb that size restricted suspension this one uh, was much more stable than the crude extract, as we can see that the cr crude extract precipitated rapidly and aggregates, while the size restricted formulation was stable. This one. Yeah. Now, 
This aggregation form, uh, for, the formation was further confirmed with the help of the fluorescence spectroscopy uh, microscopy by labeling silymarine with bil, uh, the uh, bill dye. Called by uh, results show that the sonicated silymarine uh, is sonicated with heavier fine particles. Well, in this, you can see the radon flux of uh, silymarine. There is an aggregation action. And after this, After this, uh, we did the dose optimization. And we have found that 15 mg per kg of body weight of silymarine for five days is uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, optimized for the maximum reduction of the uh, 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 ROS. And we can measure these levels, ROS, MGL levels, and protein car carbonyl. And we have found that there is a reduction in this oxidative stress markers after our uh, treatment with silymarine. To counter the excessive radical generation, there are biological antioxidant defenses present, such as catalase, SOD, uh, and glutathione, uh, and glutathione. And we checked their level, and we have found that after uh, this uh, silymarine treatment, there is an upregulation of these molecules. And finally, there is an increase in the, these are the antioxidant molecules, and after, after uh, this uh, silymarine treatment, their uh, levels were increased. These are the downstream effectors. We have also uh, checked the upstream molecules like uh, HIF-1, VGF, and EPO. These are, the, uh, these are the adaptive markers for hypoxia. And we have found that after uh, our silymelian treatment, we have found that uh, the upregulation of these molecules uh, in reducing the inflammation checked by both, uh, you know, the RT-PCR and immunoglobulin, here we can see. And we have found that this uh, silymelian is helpful in reducing the inflammation. And finally, here we can see the raw lung images that clearly show the extent to which hyperbaric hypoxia, hyperbaric hypoxia affects the lung at six hours of exposure when the rate of ascent is very high. High, And when after, after the silymarine, uh, after our this silymarine treatment, we can see that, the, that this uh, silymarine is playing positive role in reducing the inflammation. Now, finally, we conclude that this size-restricted silymarine is an effective prophylaxis against the acute hyperbaric hypoxia. Now, this is uh, finally uh, we wanted to create a model to understand the disease to disease uh, to understand the hemp disease well. So we uh, so the, we performed a very simple study. In this, uh, the rats were forced to sleep till exhaustion. After that, the rats were exposed to hyperbaric hypoxia at 25,000 feet for 6 to 18 hours. The rats were examined using a chest x ray for the sign of edema in the lungs. We found that the rats in the swimming, that uh, the rats in the swimming group uh, developed pulmonary edema. And after the confirmation of the pulmonary edema, we harvested the lungs and the plasma of rats. We have checked the level of our already identified molecule that I discussed earlier, that is the sulfotransferase, found to be highest in hip afflicted rats, that is in the uh, uh, HS group, hip plus swimming groups, and we have found that sulfotransferase is, it is a biomarker of hip and further confirming that it is one of the faithful marker for hip. We also, uh, in order to find out whether hip is associated with inflammation or not, we have checked inflammatory markers, the level of these markers, and also uh, we done the staining of these uh, uh, staining of these lung tissues of uh, uh, of uh, this non-toxic uh, HS group, and we have found that uh, that the hip, uh, that uh, that uh, the level of these pro-inflammatory markers higher in this HS group, as we can see. And thus, and not in the hypoxia group. So finally, and uh, finally, we can conclude that this is uh, related that hypo that uh, hip is related to uh, our this uh, inflammation. Finally, we also checked uh, this uh, uh, staining, and we have found that uh, there is extensive damage and fluid accumulation in the HS group. Here, 
and uh, and this further suggesting the inflammation and the leakage of fluid into the lung tissue. And these are the cardinal pathophysiological changes associated with weight afflicted lung tissues. And finally, we conclude that uh, that hair and inflammation progress in tendon and synergistic events. And this model could be used to find the molecular markers and therapeutics for the clinical management of hair. So, uh, to summarize all that I've presented, uh, we have found that higher levels were observed in rats as well as in human exposed to high altitude and could be considered for use as a biomarker uh, to diagnose hair. We also provided a proof of concept for uh, acclimatization to altitude. We have identified the molecules that would be uh, that could be helpful in assessing the acclimatization based on their tense. We establish uh, you know a panel. Uh, for uh, saliva proteome and uh, could be used as the possible uh, diagnostic panel to assess the acclimatization. We have uh, found that uh, this uh, hepatoprotective side effect uh, free prophylactic active suspension of in, uh, to prevent the high altitude induced lung damage. And finally, we created a model, uh, radiologically verified model of HAPE, and we translated our this uh, protein marker. And uh, finally, we have uh, identified the pathways which are, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, which are activated, uh, which were, yeah, which were affected uh, during this hyperbaric hypoxia exposure. So uh, these are my students, and thank you all for uh, listening. It. Thank you Can so much. Ask... Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Yasmin. And uh, now I declare this open for any questions or comments. As we can see, Dr. Tipa Singh wants to ask some. I have one question. You have used this saliva, saliva, no, for doing your studies? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So did you identify any specific protein which uh, is expressed more at high altitude as compared to the normal? Uh, actually, uh, so recently, what we have, uh, we have identified one protein that. So why I'm asking this question? Because you said the level of nitric oxide goes down. Yes, sir. So. So that is the path the that is uh, which, uh, uh, going to be downregulated in case of that. So in case you provide some sort of take of nitric oxide, does the level of those proteins which you said their expression goes down, they correlate to this? Sir, we have checked actually what happened in this case uh, uh, when we are talking about this, uh, the pathways which get uh, affected uh, during this uh, high altitude exposure, the this uh, Mostly the proteins related to the saliva, sir. We have checked the liver, the plasma, <laughs> not the plasma proteins, only those proteins which are you know, specific for saliva. So we have found this, uh, you know, the carbonic anhydrase and uh, this uh, specific protein like uh, even sir, thyroidoxin. This is recently we have found that both in plasma and in saliva. It's what about peroxidases, some peroxidases. Yes, sir. Some mammalian peroxidases. They are yes, the sir. ones who. Ah, these are the peroxidases so that maintain the, you know, the redox humus species at a high altitude. Uh, so that we have also identified. And uh, so, uh, so this is because we have seen that mostly the proteins are downregulated in case of during the longer exposure of high altitude. Yeah. So how do you how do you so repair the situation? Uh, how do how uh, do these TRDO people? So actually, uh, just I want to add one more thing that this RO and NO species, which could be associated with the overload of redox equivalents in mitochondria and their self reduction in the absence of oxygen, and because of this, uh, you know, the RO species, the nitric oxide has a dynamic role. As uh, we know, that it is it, it acts as a signaling molecule. And okay, final one, one small question. Yes, sir. Uh, what what happens to the level of infections at high altitude? 
are they more susceptible to uh, sir there have studies that uh, you know uh, like uh, uh, those who are uh, uh, in terms of the infection sir this is this we can't call as a you know this is a stress and once this uh, stress this is the high altitude exposure once the person gets descend to the lower altitude this all the symptoms have you know vanished so this is not uh, like is uh, something that could be you know avoided and that could be treated and uh, by taking this you know the prophylaxis and the other uh, uh, things okay good thank you very much okay sir are there any more questions i uh, would love to uh, read out some uh, comments in the chat uh, dr pradeep uh, sharma has written wonderful work very useful particularly particularly to our army congratulations ma'am and amika writes uh, very informative and wonderful session ma'am jia has written amazing work ma'am and congratulations for your award and um, once again uh, congratulations yasmin this has been a wonderful wonderful session we have you, benefited so much uh, with this interaction Thank you.